Now, I can certainly claim the stranger's title here uh, for my presentation, Hunting uh, the Snark, and a couple of you have already addressed me what actually a snark is. The younger generation's claim was that it is something from Harry Potter, but I assure you it's not. Now, why is it a strange uh, title? Because I also think I'm doing quite a strange business, and that is hunting down democratic political representation in the European Union. The model I choose to go along with is actually the poem of Lewis Carroll of 1876, The Hunting of the Snark. And in this poem, uh, ten people set out on a very strange voyage to hunt down this unknown creature, a snark. The only one of the crew who finds it quickly vanishes. So we are left at the end of the poem without knowing what it actually is. The narrator in the end says it might be a bojum after all, but that doesn't help us either. Now hunting for democratic representation in the European Union might be a little bit less dangerous, I hope. But let me introduce first to the crew members of this sea voyage. First they are the ones who think that representation invokes a principal agent relationship based on territorially organized elections um, so that governments can be said to be responsive to the interests and opinions of the people. Elections are the key mechanisms and a simple means to ensure political equality. Now, the second crew member on the ship is those who say this standard model is not good enough. It's hopelessly outdated. It forgets about the ever more important role of informal representation Informal representation is good because those are the guys who are not yet corrupted by party ideolo ideology and the race to win votes in elections. The third one on this ship claims that representation is all about claims making. And that's the central feature. Representatives offer claims of how they see the political community and what should be done. So it is a kind of race for winning the hearts and minds of constituencies, which takes all the place all the time and not just in times of elections. So representation is defined by what the representative does and not by what it is. So it's not the snark that is important, it is the hunt. And then the fourth part are those, that's 4A and 4B, are those who see snarks everywhere. There's not only one snarks, there are multiple ones. There are parties, there are interest groups, advocacy coalitions, social movements, all those fellows. They all follow a different logic of representation. And they do that to a degree that they may even turn out to be cannibalistic. 4B are those who say, well, we should follow the logic of group representation. And there's an enormous advantage to have these multiple avenues leading to influence of the people, allowing citizens to influence policy making. And altogether, those modes guarantee a kind of democracy in the sense of non domination. That clearly rings the bell of a Madisonian form of democracy, the multiplicity of representation as a guarantee against electoral tyranny. Well, if you want to know, I'm obviously a follower of the model of 4B. Multiple modes of representation make up a system of representation. Our problem is that in a non-hierarchical, multi-level system, that can lead to non-democratic decision-making. In fact, I would claim there is so much representation going on that no one represents any longer. But why do we need to think about representation at all? I'm making three arguments. The first argument is the functional argument. There are simply some challenges societies can't deal with alone any longer. Think about environmental issues, for instance. There's a moral and ethical argument that the externalization of costs is no longer acceptable, neither for people nor for societies. And then there's an institutional argument. We created systems of representation with the European Union that are far removed from traditional institutions of representation. Thus, we have to think about new forms of democracy. The only problem is that when you look at the European modes, we created quite a lot of these institutions. You can see that by looking at the treaties, that is all well known. It's not only about parliamentary representation, you have executive representation, you have administrative representation, you have representation by civil society groups and NGOs, transnational industrial representation, crisscrossed by functional, territorial and institutional forms. It is a system in which representatives are elected or selected due to different procedures, based on different grounds, with widely different mandates 
and tasks, leading to different representative styles and modes of responsiveness, and also different forms of accountability. Now, policy making, I think we agree on that in the European Union, is a dynamic process which demands that formal and informal representatives form different levels and they collaborate across those levels to secure the outcome they desire. The possibility of a central form of representation, of democratic representation, seems to be ruled out by the evolving and non-hierarchical character of the European Union. But why is that so? Why is there this need to compound? Now, there are actually two arguments for that, three arguments, I would say. First, individuals, of course, we all do that, have complex needs, and they engage in multiple ways with the polity. Citizens, as consumers, as travelers, as activists, and so on and so forth. Compounded systems of representation allow for a segmentation of bias, and the balance by increasing the number of veto points across the representative board. Arena shifting, underpassing, overpassing are classical mechanisms to overcome joint decision traps. Secondly, the synchronic uh, existence of informal and formal modes of representation is a counterbalance to democracy's principle of equality, which does not factor in the intensity of preferences. Informal representation responds to that because it's usually those who feel most intense about something who organize themselves in order to influence a polity. The third argument is that democracy always includes decision making. It is to quote Mill an act of will, it's an act of coercion. And this act can only be legitimized if the majority offers some justification to the minority why its views should be set aside. Complex forms of representation, compounded forms of representation, lend themselves much better to this justificatory requirement because it opens up more ways, more modes of justification. The only problem is there are some dangers involved in compounded representation. There is the danger of collision and there is the danger of collusion. The danger of collision, I think, is very clear. That most obviously, ha ob obviously happens where one claim to representativeness undermines another. For example, two conflicting majorities have equal claim to regard themselves as democratically elected representatives and equal claim to trump the other in deciding a law affecting the lives of the represented. Or where a claim to represent some special need refuses to bow down to a claim to represent the public as a whole. Majorities at the European, at the national and regional levels, all with an equal claim of being elected by the citizens, may claim to be better placed than the others to represent in the making of choices, closer to what happens on the ground, able to consider the larger picture, in touch with real political communities, supported by real political parties, with real political debates, and they all claim that they are better suited to make up for the link between the citizens and the political system. But in the end, they might block each other, and we are very often in the European Union confronted with joint decision traps. Now, and if those collisions were not enough, there's also the danger of collusions. There's the risk that complex systems or compounded systems may be no barrier to collusion, between the representatives. Identifying who is responsible for what in the European Union has become increasingly uh, difficult, as all of you know, who do process tracing. Already coming to my last slide. Now, what is it? In Lewis Carroll's poem, one interpretation at least, says, the hunting for the snark is nothing but the hunting for happiness. So in the end, the ominous snark is nothing else but happiness. In the end, democratic representation in the EU may follow pretty much the standard model of representation with a few deviations. The deviations are first of all due to the European Union's lack of kind of distinct audience that we have at the national level. The electoral bond is weak. Accountability structures are fuzzy. The distance between the EP and its voters is quite considerable and intermediate institutions like parties are only developed rudimentarily. So there are four 
conclusions you could draw from them. And that very much depends on your state of mind for which one you go, I think. First one is that we accept we can only have democracy in bits and pieces. Democracy is moving in the European Union at a snail's pace, but at least it's moving. The second one is we could accept that democracy simply doesn't work beyond the size, beyond a certain size of a polity. The third one is it's all about the citizens. The citizens are not really interested. It's this kind of Schumpeterian view of the citizen. They have the right to be disinterested in public affairs. And the last one is, probably the most uh, strange one, there's an institutional adaptation need. Let's follow Joschka Fischer, institute the Senate of National MPs and the Commission. Forget about the Council. It claims to represent, but so can everyone. So MPs and MEPs are probably the only ones who represent, and that is enough. Thank you. <laughs>